Hello everybody and welcome to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series and Hendrik, brilliant to have you here. So to start with, please introduce yourself and tell everybody about the great work that you do. Thank you, Alan. I'm very happy and uh, all of you um, on, on the screen. Um, I'm Hendrik Bakera from Berlin and I run a consultancy um, for teams uh, that like the claim is enable your change. But in fact, it's more enable your transformation, like the transformation of teams and organizations to adapt to the future, to the needs um, um, of the um, society and also to the teams of uh, needs of the team. I also support leaders um, in the development. Um, and uh, then on the other side, I'm also supporting artists um, in projects. Um, as, so that's a hobby. I'm also a painter. Um, um, for personal reasons. Uh, yes, that is basically what I do. Yeah. Fantastic. And where's the best pay place for people to find you if they want to know more? Yes. So the, my company's uh, name after my name, hendrikbakera.de. So I'm from Germany, Berlin. So DE is uh, the suffix. And so Hendrik Bakera. And uh, the art aspects are on the soulgoldagency.de. Great. Okay. So uh, plus, uh, Ellen, I forgot one thing because it's so old, but it explains a little bit where I'm coming from. Um, I have written several books uh, when I finished uh, university, and um, and the, it's also out in English. And it, uh, the website is called mypurpose.de, and uh, it it was the reflection about how can you create flow in your life uh, with the hypothesis you create flow if you focus on your values already ba way back then so uh, i wrote those uh, aspects uh, about 2000 earlier than 2000 but the book is still out it has been uh, reviewed and adapted to today so um, that's also a nice place to start um, I, I love to look at what i'm doing I love that um, modesty, Hendrik. You know, you introduce yourself and then you say, oh, and I forgot, I wrote several books <laughs> 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and they are still alive. It's so interesting. The, yeah. the, like the con when you write a book, it, it really crystallizes something in you. And so there, it, it, it's a beautiful space to, to know that the book is in me in a way. Um, and I refer back to these topics I've learned about life at that time um yeah um um and apply it to today and uh, that's that's a cool thing yeah I, I share that with you too because my first book was uh 2013 mm -hmm. and i'm sure you will have noticed something similar that in the 11 years since 2013 and maybe time before that values has become like almost a buzzword now compared to what it was before. And in some ways, I feel that that's progress because people seem to be talking about it a lot more and seem to recognize the power of it a lot more. But the bit that I'm kind of disappointed at is that it still remains talk a lot of the time yeah. rather than action. Mm -hmm. and what's your perspective on that? Well, values become really relevant in teams when they are are the a safe container for conversation when it gets tough and difficult. And if this is true, then this is really relevant and beautiful. Very often in organizations, you have like um, an idea. You say this we should do, so there is a lot of intention. That's all nice. Um, in, a, in a workshop or in a meeting, but um, when it comes then to decision making or when it comes to there is a disagreement in a conversation or so on, then suddenly all those things don't matter. Yeah. And then, uh, then there is a huge um, a frustration then for employees, for instance, uh, when this happens. And then you don't need to talk about values anymore. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I've I've done value journey since 2005 with organizations. And yes, it's true to have at that time, uh, since this was the first conversation, that was really beautiful 
you know, people loved it. it. It was deep. And if you measure it, like with Barrett's values assessment, you are really spot on and, and then you can go deep. Um, and, and nowadays this has been done often, but it hasn't been implemented in the right way um, or that it has, that the values have consequences. Um, and then it becomes uh, ho hollow yeah. uh, in a way. That is that is the one dimension I see. The other dimension I, I see right now, and that makes me very happy that I'm in the, you know, talking about values as well. It seems the only way that we can talk apolitical with each other. Yeah. Very you know, nowadays, you know, given, you know, all the, also the political um uh, left and right uh, 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 distress on both sides, at least in Germany. Um, it's sometimes very hard because people have very strong opinions and suddenly they really only talk at each other, if at all, or just stay in their bubble. Um, and if you manage to get a conversation on a values level, um, then people can still merge with each other and and experience themselves as uh, as united as they always should experience themselves. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so so the 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 value of talking about values is still true, and we need to make sure that this uh, is not just as you said, Alan, just talk, but it's actually um, a felt experience between people who are in in engagement with each other. Quite right. Quite right. So now uh, let me, oh, yeah. can you please guide me? Oh, I'm all in games. Oh, I didn't say that I'm, you know, I'm really into games. So when, oh, yeah. uh, how can you make happy, Hendrik happy? Uh, gather friends or the family around the table and choose uh, any game. And then- Well, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, not too long ago, somebody I was speaking to, they had a family occasion Mm. Uh, around about 20 people around a table for a meal. And so what she did was uh, handed out a values jam card at random mm. to each of the people around the table. Mm. And then over dessert, they had to talk about the value in the context of one of the other people around the table, not leaving anybody out. Oh, beautiful. So, so you can use it for all sorts of things. I've had... Um, so obviously we're one to one now. But I think the largest event that I've done with Values Jam was a women's network group online for two thousand people. Wow! And so we had a, a Values Jam demonstration and then breakout groups, and everybody had their smaller Values Jams. So one of the things I love about the game is that we designed it. So Lisa Bertels is the other co-founder. We designed it to be very um, not one dimensional in terms of this is the only game you can play. So we encourage people to just find their own games to play with it. Right. Yeah. I played, and actually I played it with my, um, then he was five, a five year old grandson. And so the game that I played with him was uh, first I asked him or I told him that we were going to go through all of the cards and he had to tell me whether he knew the word or he didn't know the word, mm -hmm. because obviously this deck is for adults and some bigger words. So we did that first. Then with the smaller uh, group of words that he did know, uh, I got him to force rank each time out of two. So, Jacob, do you prefer family or experiment? <laughs> <laughs> and so we did this and his favorite his favorite three cards were love, beauty, and kindness. Oh, how beautiful. It makes me, I, I get a bit emotional just telling the story, but it was just so good. And then I said to him, okay, Jacob, so uh, let's think about love. What does love mean? And he said, I don't know. I, ca I, I can't tell you. So I said, okay. So what, what do you do uh, to people that you love? And he said, I give them a hug. Mm-hmm. Just so, oh, so beautifully simple. And so much about uh, stereotypes and male uh, energies, right? Kindness yeah. is third value. Yeah. I think that's it's so beautiful. Yeah. So anyway, how many piles yeah. of cards shall I make in front of me? 
May we have chosen one or yes, we do five. Five. Okay. So we are already okay. having picked one card, which is called playfulness, right? <laughs> As a value. So now I've got pile one on my left and pile five on my right. So which number yes. pile? Four. Four. Okay. So that's this one here. And I've got uh, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen cards. So a number between one and eighteen. Eight. Eight. Yeah. Eh. Timelessness. Okay. Well, Pretty. let's see how we deal with this one. So the card is openness. Ah. <laughs> and the first question is: what Does openness mean? And also, what does it look, feel, and sound like? Mm. Beautiful. It, synchrony, we talked about synchronicities, and openness is one of the values which I hold dear and which also um, I struggle with. How open am I really about change, for instance, or, or things? But in on a, on a very practical level, is this... For me, openness is to receive a person fully as they are and the situation as it is and not going into mind, but more going into heart or getting into a sensation of relationship. Um, yeah, so, so openness has many dimensions to it, actually, right? Uh, so it feels warm. It feels... Uh, um, it has a certain softness in each, in it. Um, and since there is not so much drive, it's, it's a receiving energy. It's a receive. It's a more maybe a female energy in a way, right? It's openness for what is there. Um, so so uh, it's also very mental. On which level do I decide to listen to what we are talking here about? Mm -hmm. Am I on, you know, am I am I actually feeling or or thinking through what other people are saying, or do I just compare this as my notes in my my head and then uh, respond to what I say? So true openness is live and be in the reality of the other person. What a great start, thank you. Um, and there's some some things that you haven't mentioned that come to mind for me. Uh, so for me, openness feels uh, non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like you were saying, um, openness feels like not, not going too deep initially, you know, to in order to find a reason to make a decision, just accepting it for what it is on the surface. Mm. Um, when you were talking about it being very mental, I was curious about that because I was also thinking about how you can be open, openness can come from the heart, yeah. so open hearted, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, which might not marry with what is in your head sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then also um, body language. I was thinking about how openness uh, can sometimes be very visible. So, you know, when you meet somebody and it's the open arms mm -hmm. uh, to welcome a hug, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than, you know, you get the feeling that somebody doesn't actually want to be too close to you. Mm -hmm. um, so then maybe then less open from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And what about images, Hendrik? When you think about openness, what images come to mind and what sounds come to mind? Well, for me, it's a bit of a dance. Like uh, the image was really like, like a, I'm, I'm dancing with a lot, a, a group of people or contact improvisation. And then, you know, you know, you know, contact improvisation where you dance in a free form, no. everybody has a center, you connect them physically, could this could be your hand and this could be mine. And then you start to do something, move around and you're open to every movement and so on. So it's, it's a very, it's a fluid um, energy. Um, um, but there is, when, when we take this example um, of, of, of input theater, 
it is still there's this one connection there's the focus comes goes with the other person right okay okay and for me openness uh, the image that comes to mind is that open arms are, are welcome if you like so not necessarily to say come here to me but just open arms implying that you're not putting any barrier between you and the other person uh, and it's an open welcome and sounds openness sounds wonder i can't i can't think of a sound that comes to mind readily actually um well for me it's like when you look at a friend or uh, or a loved one and in the eyes, you know, there's cut, it doesn't need to be this big, but can be a sparkle in the eyes. And then the sound, it's like a warm hmm for me. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. And actually you mentioning the eyes, that's true as well, because sometimes how, it, there must be something physical, but I'm not quite sure what it is. When sometimes you look into somebody's eyes and you know that they're not guarded, mm -hmm. they're being themselves, and they're wanting to engage at that level. Whereas other people, sometimes you really get a strong feeling that there is a shield and they're mm -hmm. playing a role and that's the role they have to play kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But how, how do we detect that? There must be something scientific behind that. Oh, Oh, well, the, 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 there's a lot to say about that. You know, you need also to be open if somebody is more uh, closed as a person and, and doesn't share so much. Um, uh, just I, I, we can't make them do this. So openness also accepting the person in who where they are. So the, the scientific basis I'm using often is neurocolor like what happens in the brain and what you know what uh, what elements are strong in the other person and 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 i use that a lot to also to uh, to just feel what is the need of the other person if there is an openness there is also a need in a relationship um, and what is it where do i move um, and this helps new color helped me a lot to see the different uh, traits of people mm, okay and there's also something about uh, openness not being uh, a fixed state mm. i think it, it reminds me of what you were saying about the fluidity of that dance um example that you gave where when two people meet if one leads with openness often the other person can become more open over a period of time um and I, Values Jam does this, but and I've learned if something pops into our heads to just share it. My yeah. stepfather told me that he went to visit my sister recently and they have a new dog, uh, a rescue dog that was not very well treated. And he said that he went into the house on his own and the dog went for him, <laughs> all growling, all teeth going, Um but then when the dog knew that he was with my sister, yeah. it became more friendly and allowed him to pat it on the head and then everything became okay. So there's an example of where certainly that dog was not open <laughs> to start mm -hmm. with, but when they became more confident and understood the other person, then they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a more concrete question now. So we've had a great opening talking about kind of openness in principle. Um, could you please share a time where you have noticed a lack of openness? So openness not being present. Mm. Many, uh, or, or to a certain level. Um, what it's, interesting when i as a, as a consultant uh there is at times organizations want to make the teams work and so before the workshop you know we are open and discuss it and then of course there is a workshop things happen 
And often they run, then they not necessarily say, oh, let's now debrief this. And what is the next step? How can we go deep, more open like this? But they take what they've gotten and they, let's now move. Now it's good. So we got the pill. That's it. And there's often not the a real conversation about, so, okay, how have you shown up as leader and what could be another level of showing up? Uh, like like this openness to, to be in a learning mode. Uh, since we had the great start, let's move it on. And there is often like a, maybe the personal persona or the expectation, maybe they, because I try to lead them somewhere where they don't know where I would go. I, I'm not sure what it is, always is, but this had to happen at times. Where, yeah. where I would say, be open to the fantastic possibilities here. Uh, um, I love, I love the way you you frame that because I, I'm I'm the same. Uh, I prefer to leave openness for possibility rather than just follow a rigid plan that you knew was going to happen. Yeah. Um, and there's something about many people's psyche which makes them more comfortable with a known plan, known steps, known objectives when we've got to each stage. But what can often create much more value is not knowing <laughs> and just creating the environment for people to flourish, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But this is so against the way how we manage, not lead, but manage uh, systems and organizations um, in a big time. Yeah. And that's, you know, my research on flow, that you need that openness in order to, uh, to create this happiness inside of you and this high performance as well. So, uh, so if it's not prescripted, if you don't know the exact solution of the uh, of the roadmap or how to how do you get to your dream, you have much more likelihood to experience flow when you value this journey. If you think this journey is valuable, then you do it. Otherwise, you would say you're crushed. Yeah, yeah and Hendrik, you. You're um, kind of encouraging me to share one of my favorite stories that de I think demonstrates this very well. Uh, I'm just conscious that I've probably used it on these Value Jam sessions before. So if anybody's listening to this one that's heard it before, then I apologize. But it's such a great story, I think, that I I'm going to share it anyway. And I was... I, I didn't hear it yet. You didn't? Okay, good. Well, that's... I, didn't, I didn't hear that second. But... So I was opening a new call center on a an estate of properties. And uh, so I was the supplier and I said to my client, um, you know, we're opening this new call center, so we need to discuss the uh, KPIs, right? So that, 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 was, that was the opening. And he said to me, and I'm, I'm just gonna use simple numbers to make the point here. He said, well, the existing call centers are operating at 70%. So we need to be a bit more than that. And I'll, as long as we're better than the existing, I'll be happy. Now, I was new in the job. I'd come from five-star hotels where the mentality isn't, can we do a little bit better than before? It's more, what is the possibility? Mm -hmm. So I was a bit confused, but he's my client, so I didn't really want to question it. And uh, I said, OK, let me go and talk to my team about this. And uh, so I went to the team and I said, look, the client has said 70 percent of the existing estate. He would be happy with a bit more than that. So should we go for, say, 75 percent? They said, uh, well, we're bonused on on the, <laughs> the KPI. So instead of 75, could you negotiate and maybe we end up at 72 or something like that? <laughs> so now I'm even more confused. I took a couple of days to think about it. And then I decided to go back to the client and I asked him, was he open-minded about a suggestion? And he said he was. And so I said, what I'd like you to do uh, is accept no target for year one in the new call center. And I also want you to guarantee the team bonus for year one. And I want us to see what is possible. 
Mm. Now, fortunately, he was quite a progressive leader and he agreed to this. And one year later, we had recorded 95%. Super. <laughs> I, I just, it what makes... a fantastic example of excellence and thriving and how, how control or, or safety can limit what is possible in a team. Yeah. And I guess that the employees in that call center were ha more happy too. Yeah. And can you imagine if we had done what either he or the team wanted to happen, yeah. we would have got to the end of the year and maybe achieved 75% mm -hmm. and everybody would have been pleased with themselves. And yet we mm -hmm. would have been 20% short of what was possible without knowing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good and uh, story, and it, it's very true to a lot of situations which we as humans now facing. I believe, you know, when it comes to sustainability or so, we, you know, we are now targeting it. If you really would go for this, let's push it all the way, what we can. I think we are would be so much faster. Yeah, and it's it's like you were saying. Just I think you said it's it shows how targets can be limiting. Yeah. Um, because people generally will find a way to deliver the least that is possible in the situation if that's the way that they're being managed by the system, if you want to call it that. Yeah. yeah. And only because you can measure, you know, and there is such a focus on, on, on numbers or visibility and numbers, um, um, which is good, but if you only go on this, a lot of what's happening in systems is not measured or you can't measure it really. Um, and then there is an optimization happening, which is not soulful really. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, when I, when I talk about values, I think we talk about, you know, soul to soul connection very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, with openness then, you know, we've talked there about openness to the unknown. Um, I'm just wondering what other dimensions of openness there are. So earlier, I think you talked about openness to um, kind of the emotional state of somebody else. Uh, mm -hmm. We've talked about openness to the unknown. What other dimensions are there? well for me like openness also to inspiration inspiration so, uh, so to something higher in a way so be guided by um whatever we call it force or energy um to understand or or you know this idea that we are not little islands but actually we are all connected uh, also energetically in several forms, even though the ego will never see that and it's not able for him, for the ego to see this. Um, so openness to that truth. If Well, can I? <laughs> is it a truth? I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a felt experience with other people and others share it as well, but maybe it's also a good story. But it, it's a lovely story and it makes me more shine and others too. So I don't know. Um, it's an open, yeah, openness to not believing your own story. I think it's a huge one. We are, we are so strong in, in have, building up a story. And the older we get, the story becomes more solid. And, and, and openness to to let this go so also openness to not take yourself so serious i think this is also a good one um so more focusing on oneself um i think all of those things that you've talked about they there's something common there it's about you know whether it's what we know whether what we believe whether who we think we are it's all of that kind of known Mm -hmm. versus the what we don't necessarily understand or know mm -hmm. can explain so that that that's coming through for me is something about openness that willingness to embrace what you don't know or can't explain perhaps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the ambiguity so a willingness to embrace 
ambiguity, I don't know. And even the truth that the other the other side, like the othering, the other per other person may be true too. Maybe there are two uh, great truths in the room and they are contradicting and both are true. Yeah. Maybe this, you know, I've seen several situations about a great wis wisdom knowledge and then I hear this say, yeah, this is true. And then the next person says, but this is also true. And suddenly you see there are so many different aspects to this. Yeah. Have you seen, uh, I'm going to try and explain this, it's a graphic. Um, so imagine that you're looking into the corner of a room mm -hmm. and between the two corner walls is a cylinder. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what you can see projected onto each of the walls is the view of the cylinder from one side, which is the side of the cylinder. So what's projected onto the wall is a rectangle. And then on the other side, it's from the point of view of the circle at the end of the cylinder. So what's projected onto this wall is a circle. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I love that as a demonstration of what you've just said, where two different views are, and you know, each of the people seeing what is projected on their wall Mm -hmm. to be able to argue until the end of their life that what mm -hmm. they are seeing is either a circle or a rectangle, but mm -hmm. in fact, it's a cylinder, that the truth is a cylinder, right? Beautiful example. And I think if, if this would be more uh, acknowledged in conversations, then not all debates would be so hateful or so, uh, the, so harsh. I've just, maybe they accept, I realized this when I uh, facilitated a, the, a small world peace conference. I know it's a big word, world peace. And we had the intention to, to have energetically really that feeling of world peace in the room. You know, and we were just 200 people. Um, and then you can say, well, you know, world peace, yeah, peace feels peaceful, all easy. But we... But that's not true. If you, if you look at our reality of our planet, you know, we need to hear a lot of suffering. So the truth is also um, uh, to be open to the suffering and hearing the suffering in a way of other people. And then they can, by listening to this, there can be peace in this person. Mm -hmm. By listening collectively, we can create an understanding um, that we, we as humanity can do better together. Um, and this is, and it's definitely, it's, the shape is more complex than what you've just said with the cylinder um, of this reality. But you, if you have this attitude of openness, this the attention of openness, you don't fight about the viewpoints, but you see, oh, this is one aspect. And then, oh, I share another aspect. And, and suddenly a new thing emerges. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting when I do this in organizations. When we go deeper and they're really open, suddenly they, 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 they stop this need of, so what do we do next? What do we do with this? So but they, they, they are curious to find out more the other side. Mm -hmm. you know, and when you... When you typical were... thing, yeah? Now the production versus marketing. You know, or they, they like to fight, you know, they, they're doing... Yeah all wrong but when they're in one room suddenly they you know they can listen to each other's stories yeah but you need openness for this when you were talking then about uh, suffering it made me wonder about the difference between openness and tolerance because tolerance kind of for me anyway implies a, an, an acceptance of something that you might not necessarily agree with mm. openness feels a step further than tolerance but no, yeah well totally no tolerance is is, is is it's a small child of this is i let the other person see it but often people have to, still a judgment on this and and are not positive about that you don't really see the other person or the perspective of what they want. Mm -hmm. You just tolerate this. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I bear this. 
uh, where is this an openness is I um, I'm relating to the other person and I can much better align with that in a way. I don't need to do the same things, but uh, it feels like uh, one human experience, whereas this tolerance has has borders. Yeah, I'm tolerating this. Yeah, you know? and, and, um, and can I'm um, now? Um, what about openness as a potential disadvantage? So you can imagine a situation where. Uh, something needs to be done in a given situation. Mm -hmm. And then somebody says, oh, but we need to be open-minded about the other people's point of view. Mm -hmm. And so then a big discussion happens. And before anybody comes to agreement, the situation has passed. <laughs> and yes. whatever has happened has happened. Uh, totally. There, you, uh, um, I, I'm, 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 my background is uh, consulting, so I've worked for McKinsey as well. So high pressure cooker, very fast, very quick, uh, very efficient. Like, and, and at the same time, I try to be open there. So I can tell you, I, I know that's tension a lot. <laughs> and, and so there is, so when I facilitate open dialogues and conversations, there is a red line, a red thread going through this. Um, and there is a mental a mental aspect in me where I say, do, is this now the time for an open conversation or do we now, me as a facilitator, I make now the decision to let not open that conversation, but let have, let's move them on and then have the conversation later. You need to say, you know, the, the, the call for everybody's, everybody speaking up and all the time, can also be avoiding of the real experience. Yeah, yeah. So we start to talk over about something and, and it's a mental process where this you're open and experience something together, which goes typically much faster and you get much better, better to the point, but you need to accept the facilitator. So, in, <laughs> sorry. so I, I have actually, two values they're going next to each other you know there is a like the bigger picture and a certain structure um which i hold plus the openness you need the container yeah yeah and then so you're reminding me this was uh, just a couple of weeks ago i had a, a situation like this where it was a group session we were coming towards the end of the session and i asked each person in turn to share one key takeaway from the day. Yeah. And it came to the person two to my right, so near the end, and uh, he's just started talking and talking and talking. So I chose to say, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to translate it into your key takeaway was, and said a, a short version of it uh, and yeah. I said, is, is that anywhere near what you meant and he said yeah it is but why did you not translate for anybody else in the room <laughs> and it was at, at, by this stage we had had a very good day and the relationships between everybody was very warm and open and accepting and quite fun as well so when he said why did you not translate anybody else I said um because they were all very concise and responded mm -hmm. in the way that they had been requested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you didn't. <laughs> and everybody was laughing, including him. Mm -hmm. But there was an example of where I guess I was being very open about yeah. what we were wanting to achieve as a group, um, still bringing him along, uh, but getting to where we needed to be at that point in the day without getting derailed. Um, okay. Now, in can I? Can I? No, no. There is a, a, the, the openness of sending and the openness of receiving is what you're saying, Alan. Yes. So, because there is, if you're truly open, you know, you potentially are willing to change. Thich Nhat Hanh said this. You know, in a true dialogue, um, both sides are willing to change, and 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 you know, openness. Um, some people say I'm open with my position, but extremely sturdy 
and 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 not listening to when somebody else says something. They would only ad- reiterate what they have said. So openness to share, where there's openness to receive on a deeper level. That's a great way to put it. And then you actually, have to actually, there's a, a chance uh, for you to ask your own question about openness. So in Values Jam, there's a question which says, ask mm-hmm. your own question about openness, beginning with who, what, where, when, why, or how. And if you have the answer immediately, feel free to share. Or if you want me to go first, then I can do that. But what's your question about openness? Mm. Mm. Open. Uh, that's. I don't have an exact question for you now about openness. Is. Good. I, that doesn't come to my mind really. Is um, can you ask a question as well? Yeah, I can. I so a question that comes to my mind is, when have you? Huh. When have you felt that you were justified? in not being open. Mm. You mean not open to all arguments, for instance. Um, it, well, this is a, in, it's also a personal story in me because a uh, bit, little bit in the family system as well. The, the openness, um, for certain arguments which diminish the drama in in Germany and the Second World War and the Third Reich and so on, uh, I feel very justified to not be open to that argument. Okay. Yeah. And so there's something here about um, openness when uh, it contravenes what is important to you or your values, um, maybe. And the other example I can think of is when uh, the outcome might be uh, harm to somebody. So I can imagine a situation where you would choose not to be totally open uh, if you felt that somebody might be at risk as a result of that. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But then I guess the question is, in whose view uh, are you making that? Well, it's obviously your own, um, but some people might not have the same point of view, right? So yeah. some I'm just trying to think of a practical example to ground this. Um, so let's say you knew that a friend's child had shoplifted Mm -hmm. and the shopkeeper said to you, I think you saw that young boy or girl uh, take something from the store, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And the question is, do you admit what you saw and risk your friend's child getting into trouble or do you not? Mm -hmm. Which comes then is loyalty could would be then the other value, right? And yes. are you more loyal to your friends? Yeah, uh, so, so open the, the situation. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So in that case, loyalty trump maybe loyalty trumps openness. Yeah. Or um if it was really important to you, maybe I I guess you wouldn't be able to say to the shopkeeper, I need to think about this. I'm not sure what I saw, but you know, I'm I'm thinking I would want to speak to my friend quickly Mm -hmm. and, you know, agree what we're going to do about this because it's not, it's absolutely not right, but also it's their responsibility as the parent more so than my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, Wow. That's a dilemma. It's a huge dilemma, and, uh, and now, as you ask this question, there is this is often happening to me as well. I'm not always open to suggestions, 
in in certain uh, client situations, when when there is uh, there is a certain line up of things and discussions, and also you need to we need to assess how how can the other person actually receive what you're saying. So I'm a pretty open person, so I take share a lot also about my personal experience. And I realized that some people can't deal with this. Yeah. They can't deal with, you know, me mentioning certain emotions or my struggle. And they always say, but Hendrik, you're so educated. Or Hendrik, you are so trained. Or shouldn't you know this already? So they come up with a lot of these kind of responses. Say, Sorry, you know, 55, still still baby, obviously. But uh, so, so there is sometimes... You, and this is I needed to learn over the years. There are two levels of a re- in being in relationship with other people you don't know. Like, is there is this formal first level, and there is a certain openness, yes, uh, but it doesn't go so deep. I think you know the the British the Brits are perfect in this. Yeah, They're beautiful, elegant, yes, but <laughs> but not deep. So so whereas you know as a, as a German, when somebody asks me how are you. I gave you a long explanation what's happening in me. Well, I gave before when I learned is now that's not what they're asking. Yeah. So, so, and, and I don't want to actually share because there is an emotional response to them uh, from other people. Do I really want this now? So, um, yeah. So openness and moderation in a way. Um Maybe I share another situation. I have talking. We talked about climate change and all this. Yeah. I'm connected to a lot of people who are beautiful speakers um, on this topic, and they are sometimes for 20, 30 years in this market. They know this exactly what's happening there. And um, well, and they are open as well. But the real openness comes when I speak to them behind a video behind a public uh, uh, meeting and so on. And they share their true frustration about the whole situation on the planet. They wouldn't share that, uh, you know, in the public speech really, because they want to engage and don't scare people away. (laughs) And so it's very conscious what they're doing. They're friendly, they don't try to scare. But um, if you are with them on a beer uh, in private, uh, um, they, they show a different picture. And I think this, we also need to learn that people have different um, have different aspects in their lives, which I can share with you. So what we're coming to here is that at the beginning of the conversation, I think we were moving in the direction of, uh, of course, openness is a good thing to have and everybody benefits as a result. And now we're actually coming to the realization that you need to temper that with an understanding of the impact that it might have in certain situations or for certain individuals uh, Mm. when you're displaying that, which I think is a a really fitting uh, time to bring this values jam to a close. And there's always one final question. And Mm. it is, what are you encouraged to do differently about openness as a result of our conversation today? I think I will articulate that more clearly in the space, like what we do, having these distinctions out there. So yes, openness is good, but also what is the other value in here? What is at play to, um, what is the right level of openness uh, that I um, bring this to my clients more, more, uh, more directly and also for myself. Uh, the, the idea is that the general to assess how open does the other person want to be and be in alignment with that and with this dance, coming back to what I've said in the beginning. Yeah. And I, I've got... Um, Why the dance better? My, my view is very similar in that uh, I'm thinking openness does not exist in a vacuum. It's more connected than to think of it in that way. Um, but the the one thing that I am going to take away from this conversation is the cylinder and the circle. I've always loved that um, diagram. Yeah. 
but I'm now imagining a situation when I'm dealing with two people who don't agree with each other mm -hmm. and I'm going to use that diagram to show to them. And I think what it will do is help them quickly understand that there can be a different point of view that you might not understand why uh, somebody else sees it differently because you're so sure you're looking at a rectangle. <laughs> <laughs> so... Absolutely. Hendrik, thank you so much for joining me for this Values Jam. You're now a qualified Values Jammer. I'm very proud of this. Uh, I need, where do I get the badge? <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you the link. You can get the cards uh, there. Yes. Actually, pass it forward is a theme of Values Jam. So yes. uh, if, you, if you can, uh, we always suggest that you think about ordering at least two decks because then you give one away for free as a yeah. gift, because we know people love receiving them. So I'll, I'll let you know how to do that. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Alan. It was a great pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.